I think that the two biggest fallacies that we have regarding trying to understand somebody like a Lincoln who's so mythologized is the um, b- extremes are never good. And you have those who have um, romanticized him to the point of making him an angel, um, inaccessible even to um, the idea that he was a human being, right? With flaws and fallacies, like he had flaws, right? He was not, he was limited as a human being to, yeah. to try to do the best in the situation an incredibly impossible situation that he uh, went, walked into on the stage of history. And then you have the slanders who try to paint him as a demon, a, a tyrannical demon who just like right. dismantled people's right to property right. and uh, was a, just a total dict- dictatorial tyrant who undermined states' rights and the rights of each individual state to do whatever they wanted to do. And thus he's a dictator. So you have like both sides that do a disservice to the truth. And I think it's no coincidence that when you look at a lot of these uh, big, big meta narratives, they're both funded by the enemies of Lincoln. Like a lot of the, the Copperhead, um, you know, uh, politicians of the North who were part of the Wall Street uh, Eastern establishment faction were pouring money into narratives trying to paint Lincoln in a heroic, angelic way early, right after he died. And um, it's like, why? You, you, what, what, do, what do the Astors, what do, what do, the Morgan click, what, what do all these, these groups have? What's their interest in trying to paint Lincoln as this like incredible hero? And so the thing is Lincoln was doing something that sure, every you. great president is, is essentially tapping into when they get shot at or they die in office. And, uh, and it's really something which scares the hell out of the oligarchy even today, because it's still something that w- if it were tapped into today, if it were recognized that there was this constitutional principle embedded in U S history as a tradition, then even now at this late stage of rot, the United States could save itself and the world Mm -hmm. from the hell that's coming on fast as far as a broad controlled demolition of a bubble banking system, a a bubble speculative economy founded upon impossible rates of impayable debts um, managed by a financier class of wannabe overlords trying to manage the chaos and introduce their idea of a technocratic order um, after said chaos and, you know, also the danger of a major war, um, breaking out internationally. So the, there are things which apply just as much today as they did in 1860 to 65, oh, yeah. as much as they did to 1776. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I recently had a, a, um, I went to a town hall meeting in, uh, in Canada. I saw that clip. That was a good clip. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't understand the French, but I could understand yours. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was useful because it, it the, the fellow who I was speaking to, who, who would, uh, was the primary keynote speaker at the event, was a fellow named Maxime Bernier, who heads a uh, party called the People's Party of Canada. It's sort of model, he models himself on a Canadian uh, type of Donald Trump persona. I think he's genuine overall, and I, I think he generally speaks well against the uh, encroaching dictatorship of a, of, of a world government and a lot of the mandates that have been draconian and absurd for the past couple of years. He's spoken consistently and well um, on all of these matters, really, really fights a lot, really hard for personal autonomy, um, economically, uh, health-wise, everything. All of these things are, are good and attractive, but in my question to him, I you know basically posed very simply, well, the, the, the uh, oncoming tsunami of the economic blowout is going to destroy a lot of lives. A lot of innocent people are going to be wrecked. Um, do you see a role for the sovereign nation state as a, a tool to protect people from that oncoming uh, collapse? You know, I gave the example of restoring something like Glass-Steagall, the, the breaking up of the banks and the separation of the contaminated toxic waste yeah. banking part of the economy of speculation from the, the clean and legitimate part. My friend uh, who asked the question after me followed up on that similar vein, asking him, well, what about uh, the role of the nation in uh, having providing a vision for the, the next generation? And without a vision, the people perish is the, the, the you know, the ancient quote. And it's, it's, it's not just a truism. It is true. Without a vision of, for the future, the people do perish. Sure. Um, and he gave the example of what we were doing in the 1950s and 60s, building me- mega infrastructure in Canada. We stopped doing that for 50, 60 years now. But he gave the example of that. That's what we were doing. We we're using a, a national bank, the Bank of Canada, to emit 
credit to give loans to entrepreneurs to build things. Um, he gave the example of the U.S. And, and also of China today, which is capable of building incredible mega projects in our day and age without having to go and ask for usurious loans from the IMF or the World Bank or, or private financiers. And instead, they could just do it themselves. And it works. It works damn well. Working. And unfortunately, on both counts, uh, the response we got was your typical libertarian type of uh, response, which was the role of the government is to just do nothing. If I got political power, is what Maxime Bernier was saying, I would essentially fulfill my responsibility of contracting all of, of removing the national sovereign government from any involvement in economic affairs. And if that means, and he said, you know, the, the economy has to collapse, so be it let it collapse. And if, and people should just be prepared to live in pain for a bit, but know that have faith that there will be a, an emergent new, better system that uh, could involve a mix of Bitcoin and, and cryptos and gold and other things. And it's like that idea. And also for the banking system, absolutely not. He, in his view, the bank, uh, a national bank and debt that caused by a bank can only be destructive. It can only be inflationary. He, and he exhibited, as, as most libertarians express the same ignorance, an inability to think about anti-inflationary debt. Right. Um, so government can only do evil. It can't do good. And obviously, we, we see enough examples of government being used for evil ends. But to say that thus, it can't be all used inversely, like a knife can be used to cut your bread or kill your neighbor. You can't imagine uh, using the power of the government as a weapon for the good against, against your enemies. This, you know. Um, and creative destruction was another aspect of it. You know, that there's this idea of Schumpeter's, you know, uh, destruction. We should let the markets just be in self-organized. And if a destruction happens, it's for the good because we'll um, something, some, some, the tension and chaos of the destruction is going to induce creative innovation. Now, that, that's a theory which is a theory. And I think when you look at history, um, as it actually happen instead of as somebody theoretically tried to pretend it happened but as actually as history unfolded with how and and look at how did big projects happen how did creative bursts ever happen you can find that yeah destruction often happens and sometimes uh creativity is the effect of destructive destructive uh processes but more often than not destruction is the effect of destructive prop uh of, you know events and right. yeah, more yeah. destruction after that. And then dictatorship as a solution to that destruction right. caused by those same arsonists who caused the destruction, then introduce the, 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 the Napoleon or the Hitler or whatever. That's right. usually the case. So it, to, to say that, no, I can't imagine the role of the government as being good or the, na the, the, the national bank as being useful is absurd. It's a, correct, a correction that really needs to happen across the minds of people across conservative political spectrums all over Canada including the conservative party and a and major, a major part of the Republicans yeah. also have to deal with this vote, you know, and, and Europeans as well. Yeah. So Lincoln McKinley as our focus today, I think is really good because these are two examples of two Republicans. No one can call them liberal <laughs> who um, did not suffer from these um, uh, fallacies of, of yeah. yeah. <laughs> And instead actually shaped history. They were actually on the ground in corridors of power, using powers of government in order to shape history towards a certain effect. And, uh, and that's important that we, we flesh out some of that and demystify some of that, both for those who hate Lincoln and those who love him for the wrong reasons. So if you hate him for the wrong reasons or you love him for the wrong reasons, you're doing yourself a disservice. You won't learn anything. Right. Yeah, we love Lincoln, too, because he was up against it the same way that you just mentioned in regards to when they crushed the second national bank. So what that period from 1836, 37, all the way till 1860, it was a free for all. I mean, there were totally. so many currencies and banks and state banks. And remember you? Yeah. I mean, oh, I, yeah. There was like four. Th yeah. I remember them reading that in your book and just. Yeah, I, I don't remember the number exactly, but it was anarchy and people like celebrate um andrew jackson for having been the right. guy who killed the bank killed right. the national bank of hamilton the second bank and and paid off the debt and you know there's this famous story of how he you know really wanted i paid the debt to be you know something that he's rem remembered by uh, yeah. for the ages and he, yeah he he did kill the bank and he did pay the debt but what were the consequences because what happened after 1836 
Oof. And when you look at that period from 1836 on right to the spark of the uh, the, the firing at Fort Sumter um, yeah. that launched the, the Civil War, um, it was hell. It was 30 years of wealth transfer into a, an oligarchical uh, master class that had sort of a three-pronged component in terms of the British steered deep state operations in the Americas uh, that Lincoln had to deal with. Um, part of it had to do with the um, the Southern sort of Virginia Junto that right. benefited massively in terms of, you know, like this was the fourth biggest economy of the world by 18, 1855 because of their, their primary export being, you know, slave labor cotton purchased 80% of that being purchased by Great Britain, which had more or less the monopoly on textile, or they wanted to have a full-blown monopoly globally on, on textiles that converted uh, raw materials like cotton into clothing or other fabrics. Um, that's That made the South the, mo the most wealthy damn place, but wealthy from the standpoint of money, not wealthy from the standpoint of potential powers of production or, or potential in terms of activating the, the powers of mind to make discoveries and inventions, That not that just pure in terms of like wealth and wealth begotten by extraction of physical human labor that could have been cows. You know, if cows had the ability to pluck cotton, they would have done, used cows, but they didn't. And they bred human beings like they did breed horses and cows. That's why they, even though there were no imports of slaves at a certain point in the, in the 19th century, the population still doubled from 2.5 million to over 4 million by right, right. between 1830 and 1860s so you're like how did that happen well because they were breeding them like animals yeah. breeding actual human beings with souls true. like animals right yeah. and uh and there, there was a black market no pun intended as well uh, for imports as well um so yeah the, andrew jackson by by paying off the debt he contracted the entire um money supply that had been put into work by building things like the erie canal thousands of infrastructure projects that were were really increasing the productive powers of labor quality of life longevity life expectancy overall population of the american people uh between eight you know 1790 to 1836 there was a huge increase the malthusians were pissed off because those who were who worshiped at the temple of malthus the the temple of you know human beings are a parasite um of overpopulation yeah. to be cured by a master class of social engineers that that temple of Malthus, okay. their their um formula of of populations will over always exceed the ability to support them was being broken by the example the living experiment in 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 effect of the united states as an experiment in the world um you were able to actually have new technologies constantly being introduced an idea of self-perfectibility animating the hearts of the people as your normal ethic and value system that also translated into the behavior of money that people expected to serve the interests of both themselves as individuals but also of the nation as a whole so all of that stopped all of these projects stopped being built the and you had things like the um the 1846 independent treasury act that soon came on board too that completely cut off legally the government from having any influence over economic affairs and it gave and immediately all of the power to issue uh, to coin uh currencies was given to state and local banks and you had something like and i forget the number too but it was in the thousands of local yeah, currencies like all being emitted by each individual bank on every little state level which caused what a complete basket case economy nobody wanted to invest in the u.s treasuries anymore no no international investor wanted that because you had a, a, a discohesion of the nation right and all of a sudden everyone started dividing dividing themselves up into smaller little micro units of mini interests and there was no national coherence of anything you had complete deregulation of like national deregulation the destruction of national protectionism so a flooding of the american markets with cheap goods produced by britain destroyed local manufacturing right that just like it does today that's that's how it's also used under glo under globalization um it's same thing back then same and back bank then. runs so you have yeah. the big bank panic of 1837 where you know the 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 markets became speculative no longer were investments tied to building things and the bubbles quickly inflated and blew as the fiction that they were and you had a series of bank runs bull and bull and uh, bear markets now destroying the economy for the next 20 plus years and the last thing 
as far as wealth transfer <laughs> that Jackson did. Because what did Jackson do, right? In the 18, 1831 or so, he passed the, um, um, forgetting the name now, the Indian um, Reservation Act or the Indian Removal Act. But basically, this I think it was, a, it was the Removal Act. Act. Yeah. The Removal Act, yeah. This thing completely was a genocide operation that tra- that extracted the Cherokee that had been living for generations in the southern states, especially on the on the uh, east coast, and extracted them and forced them to move thousands of, of miles away through frigid temperatures. Many many died. I think upwards of four thousand, conservative estimate, died en route. But they they were uprooted. And all of that, that land that was very, very useful primarily for growing cotton was given over for pennies to the slave power, which okay. then turned this region from, 18, from the 1830s all the way for the next 30 years into the biggest um, deep south slave uh, plantation zone. Yeah. Um, yeah. The native and- folks have been getting it like that for so long. You know that story yeah. about the Osage? They kept pushing them around and then they finally pushed them right onto some land that had oil. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's, that's a great story. Yeah. When I was doing the research for the 1769 project, uh, Ethan sent me that book. It's the killers. Uh, it's the uh, killers of the flower moon. There you go. And I think they're actually maybe somebody's making a movie on it, I do believe. But it's a hell of a story because you get these Indians that were being moved around like different places, Oklahoma, here and there. And they finally stuck them in a spot that was so horrible. They were like, "Okay, there's nothing there. We'll just leave them there. And then they found oil. So in the early 20th century, by 1920, there were native Indians living there literally with chauffeurs and like, you know, white glove. So, I mean, they were living like rich. And then all of a sudden they started dying. Some mysteriously, <laughs> some straight up killed. And in the book, they show you how they went in there and tried to usurp wealth out of these folks. Wow. And a few resisted. And it's a hell of a story, actually. I would like to see that story. Yeah, that that's that's really rich. Um, <laughs> that's what I read it. <laughs> well, yeah, there there is just I mean, people underestimate. They, they, they a lot. I mean, I'm myself too. I didn't really think about it until somewhat recently in life, uh, in terms of the artificial, um, and not just the artificial, the evil agenda behind the reservation system. And in Canada too, you know, the, these reserve yeah, systems had brilliant. always a very evil objective to um, create these prisons without walls right. in order to plug people in. You know, the, these different people who'd been living here for thousands of years, probably tens of thousands of years in many cases and plug them into these small controlled zones. And if anything, um, create this two pronged approach to imper- colonial imperialism, which was on the one hand, destroy these people and, and, and steal their land. On the other hand, um, like this is a big one in Canada, uh, manipulate the culture of the natives of the First Nations people in, in order to think that they are intrinsically opposed culturally to everything that Western civilization run by white European um, racist males is that, that that's all Western civilization is. And a lot of these racists managing this narrative for the natives, um, they themselves are, like I said, they're absolutely racist there. There's money behind these, uh, these programs to try to, it's called eco-imperialism to convince the world and convince the natives specifically that they are just natural parts of their fixed ecosystems. And to the degree that you allow technology or any type of industry or anything like that, that affects both the ecosystem or affects their, their uh, ancient ways of, of doing things of like hunting, gathering um, it's unnatural and thus evil and exploitative and you should fight against it. And it's like, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe, um, <laughs> these people want perhaps some development. Maybe they want some skills and maybe they want to learn science and that maybe science is not something purely for white colonialists, but maybe it's discovering the, the universe, which is in everybody's right and to enjoy the fruits of said discoveries, regardless of your religion or culture or race, you know, which is technological progress and making your life better for your kids. Maybe that's something that they actually do want. And when you actually talk to a lot of the, the people who live in these reservations, that is actually what they want. It's mostly sure. just like white, you know, <laughs> privileged, you know, kids being indoctrinated in Marxist run universities who think that that's actually unnatural. 
And <laughs> most of the actual natives themselves are totally open. They want their, they don't want to live in uh, situations where they have, you know, suicide rates that are five times higher than your average population or drug abuse and alcohol abuse. That's like 30 times higher. They don't want it. They don't want those situations. Right. They'd be happy to get some real, to have some pipelines oh, or whatever, you know, like there's so many other, not, not, I mean, granted pipelines can be done messily and bad too. I'm not trying to say we should, <laughs> they're, they're not even brought into these discussions. You know, these discussions are being made for or decisions are being made for them by people in ivory towers in Ottawa or in Washington, like Biden or Trudeau telling them, this is what you should want. And if you want differently, it means that you've been, you're, you're, you're not, you're, you're not responsible enough to make your own decisions. And so we will put nature protection laws to protect you and keep you in a fixed state, state of stasis um, <laughs> to defend you from technology. It's like, that, that's or, what happens. Or even how, they, how they do with like um, small businesses, right? They're like, oh, okay, we'll kill the, all, the, all the small businesses. It's like a, a different version of what they did with the reservations. They're doing it at land grabs and real estate grabs yeah. now, yeah. shutting down yeah. small businesses, killing it for the middle class so that they yeah. can get the land and then reorganizing political districts and do it like it's all the same move, just in different little variants. <laughs> I know, you know, and with the natives, it's even it's even the way they twist it and say, yeah, you're a sovereign nation, uh, right? Right. So, here. so they say yeah, you, <laughs> you, you have your sovereign nation. Yeah. But you don't really have a voice and we're going to give you the worst land. Uh, we'll let you have your casinos, which actually, you know, did help them prosper in a way. But at the same time, then it always goes back to how do you distribute that money and how do you okay. actually make that money? So it's going to better your tribe. You know, that's a great point because in Canada too, it's the same thing. There's that's where you, if you want to go to the casinos, that's you can go to any reservation or a lot of the reservations, especially on the border between Canada and the U.S. You'll get your your casinos that can be are the natives are allowed to to have. If you want to buy cheap cigarettes, you know right. there's like a monopoly on that. Um, but otherwise, bootleg alcohol maybe. But otherwise, I mean, as soon as as soon as they leave their their reservation, they lose all of their their privilege, their their tax. Like there's a lot of of monetary incentives to keep them in, localized in these zones, these highly controlled. And again, it's it's kind of like concentration camps, totally. Um, such that there's money flowing in, but it's high. There's a highly um, controlled um, criminal type of structure that is encouraged, that is built up again by things like the monk school. Of global affairs run by Peter, or that, the, the dead Peter Monk, who runs Barrick Gold, that raped Africa, and that's how it accrued its billions. Yeah, you know, wow. um, and you see the same thing, the same model of yeah. exploiting um, native communities, also in Africa, also in South America and Latin America. Um, Africa is a great example. Perfect. Same thing. Yeah. You know, you you yeah. lose the this idea that centuries. Yeah, yeah, we we have to convince the people that it's that it's in their nature to not have technology. The oh, technology is right. to think otherwise makes you racist, says <laughs> the, the mostly white British run uh, right. corporate uh, slave masters <laughs> at, who are more than happy to take these underdeveloped people now because they don't have technology and or infrastructure and then just get them to sign on to IMF structural adjustment uh, right. loans and other things that make them more enslaved, more usuriously enshackled. And also the conditionalities then thrust upon them, mega, you know, British controlled, Commonwealth controlled corporations that extract their diamonds, their minerals, other things, and leave nothing for the people, but give money again to an encrusted, corrupt uh, mm -hmm. leadership class, often receiving their education from Oxford, Cambridge, you know, they've, the they've got their scholarship program to find young talent and make them, oh, you know, right. sociopathic and redeploy them back to control as local managers just like we have in the reserve systems, many cases when you look around uh, at the more prosperous, financially prosperous reserve systems, you'll, you'll te tend to often encounter a similar phenomenon. And that's no accident. It's the same policy. You know, it's funny in the, in the 19th century, you know, we knew it was imperialism. But then as you move into the 20th century, they were like, OK, let's call it globalization. <laughs> yeah. Let's indoctrinate all the university kids, even yeah. like Randy. I mean, like just my liberal yeah, education, going to Berkeley, George Washington, like just like the culture 
like I'm, I'm looking back because of you, honestly, Matt, and I'm re-examining the, the education that I received at these prestigious universities and just realizing how like, like they just put a belief there. And because I was at Berkeley and I was liberal and I believed in social justice, like, like they, like, I didn't even think about like, what, <laughs> like, it's just, it's just crazy. It's nefarious. I realize that you're being programmed when you're being programmed. I'm like, what? Like, how how did they do that? How did they get in my head? Yeah, yeah. Liberal imperialism is probably the most dangerous of, of the variants of imperialism that are out there because it's so wrapped up in empathy and caring for others, right? And good human being like qualities that we all have. We want to do good, <laughs> you know. And they're just taking that and they're like, "Oh, you're gonna do good for me." <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And it, but it, that's the thing. Like, it requires. Um, certain things to happen uh, in the mind of the victim who is processed through that. And among the, the top of those things is the uh, extraction of the belief that um, there is something universal about all human beings, regardless of our uh, skin, color, religion, uh, right. regardless of those things that make us different and special and unique and beautiful and good. Despite yeah. that different differentiation, which is which should be cherished, that's true. <laughs> there is still something even higher un universal that makes us human beings first and foremost, and then male, feminine, uh, gay, straight, black, white, whatever you want to be. That 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 should be like a you know an, a, a secondary phenomenon secondary, to secondary. your humanity. Manifest right, because if you just bring it down to like soul, like that's that. <laughs> like when you bring it down to that essence, then you can't divide anymore, right? It's like no, we're all souls. We're all human beings here on the planet. We're it's all made. Level yeah, we're great. Like just level. Exactly. Them. Then you then it doesn't matter if you're black, white, whatever, gay, straight. Doesn't matter. Too, too much identification going on yeah, at a certain man. point, you know. Well, yeah, and and that's what becomes. That, right? Yeah, and our when our ident identity becomes too heavily rooted in the the, the sensual aspect of what. Uh, yeah. distinguishes us as far as tone of skin or whatever right make it's a big list uh we we become more bounded by the material senses and we lose an ability to see with the mind's eye yeah. which is tied to something on high right where you yeah, can't sure. see yeah. like my my sense of immortality you can't see that but it's there that mm -hmm. sense that okay there's something that i'm gonna die we're all gonna die that's part of being a material being in a material universe but then there's this other immaterial spiritual component I never really die <laughs> and <laughs> <that> was, <laughs> so. now you're getting into our terrain <laughs> but that's there right like and, and no like, we, we love that you go there brother because yeah. it's important like to bridge it and i'm not down on really any of the religions or their well, I am a little down on some of their dogmas, but in terms of that younger souls are going to need different types of belief structures to get it. But it's true. As you get into the older soul cycles, you really want to get down to the essence, which I think just goes down to the individual soul. And we each got our connection to source or God or creator, however you want to call it. But yeah. I, I, I don't think the dogma drives, I know my life, like it did even as I was being, you know, growing up, being raised Catholic, because mm -hmm. as soon as I started to be able to think at seven, I started asking questions that I noticed just by the looks in the adults faces <laughs> and the priests that they didn't have the answer to what I was asking them. And that yeah. was my beginning of like, oh, boy, I'm going to have to go do a little <laughs> more work here because they're not going to just give it to you. And some don't even know. Yeah. So then like, where do you go? And that's why everybody's on this big kick right now. Well, you got to go within. You got to go within. Well, some people be like, yeah, well, where do I go within within where, you know, <laughs> that's what my dad would say. Where, where do I go? What do you mean within where? Where's my soul? Yeah. And obviously we know I always tell people it's more can more closer to the heart than you realize, because sometimes you'll get there that way. Some are maybe more visual or you have a traumatic experience that puts your life in jeopardy and that wakes you up, so to speak. You yeah, I, I think that that's oftentimes uh, like, what was it, Abigail Adams? had a quote that I'm going to paraphrase that um, and she's the mother of John Quincy Adams, you know, and, and she said, uh, awesome. uh, we, we should be, uh, we should wish to find times of trial and tribulation because it brings out the best in, in young people. And, and it makes uh, little men become great. Um, right. And I don't think that it's absolutely necessary that an existential crisis should necessarily come and threaten us and we should necessarily have to suffer in that way in order to leap outside of ourselves and tap into something bigger 
although right. it tends to often happen that way. Um, but I think in a, you know, you'd like to think that in a, in a healthy society, um, liberated from the structures of oligarchical and, you know, right. enslavement and all of this sociopathy that you would be able to at least help young people tap into that source that you tapped into at the age of seven, at, in a, in as most natural and organic a way as possible, probably through arts as well, playing a, a, pr a pretty important role in that um, so that they can learn um, with a deep emotional connection, the consequence of living by or abiding by your lower impulses and folly and such that you will then want to abide by the higher call of conscience right. and, and wisdom, right? That's the idea. Um, Yes. And, Again, even, and, and even proper rites of passage, you know, at different ages really helps. I mean, we got little Eva, who's a... Yeah, she's almost seven, right? She's or like, six, yeah. I mean, that little one, I mean, there's there's a really old soul who has parents that are really acknowledging her for the old soul she is at she a is really a young age. And she's just a <laughs> woo buddy. And, you know, not vaccinated. And you just see what a natural little... Homeschooling. Yeah. Kid is could be. You know, and right. just left alone, you know, like, yeah, to some. Yeah, degree. yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I, I've got examples of kids and I, I've, I've known throughout my life, you know, different kids who exib exhibited this incredible power of insight and reason and like wisdom that is beyond their age. And I've also witnessed a lot of these kids grow up a little bit. Some now are in their 20s. And the, but the, the destructive effect of an, of a bad school system, a bad culture that they're put into that then takes this, this power they had when they were six, seven, eight years old, and then diminishes it. Yeah. Um, Take and that's, that's something that should be cherished and enhanced. And you've got to fuel that fire, not, not put them in a situation where they are rewarded for, you know, abiding by a consensus, you know, party line or getting the right answer at the end of a textbook, which is often the case. And that dilutes the ability to feed the hunger for uh, right. truth and like ask questions, learn, you know, the, 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 the exciting thing about the path of towards truth in my experience. And I think for you guys too, is the, is the meeting the cognitive dissonance, the paradoxes, mm -hmm. and then being fascinated by, um, well, what lies beyond it? Well, what is the truth? And, and, and having a question driven approach to sure. things is so much better than just having an expectation to get answers like yeah, yeah. what are the rules you know like what that that's the worst thing to start with not what are the rules that i should abide by when i'm going to go into a problem it's like what's the what what are the right questions what are the paradoxes that yeah, are going to awaken the paradoxes or the the, the the questions that will then awaken more creative thought and and that and when that candle starts growing it can become a, a blazing furnace in a good way and uh, that that differentiates you know what we talked about in this this touches on i think you know lincoln and, and the american process oh, but totally. this is what differentiates the platonic school i often you know emphasize in my writings and this is what i got by originally um studying the writings of lyndon larouche uh, the the deceased economist yeah. um who was the first to put this in in the, in this clear way to me but it becomes true when you actually read the writings of plato and you compare that to the writings of aristotle and you yeah. start seeing that wow these are two completely people say aristotle was plato's student and he carried on or advanced or perfected Plato's method. And it's like, no, a little different there. their paradigms are incongruent with each other. They're incompatible paradigms. One is a complete um, crystallized final answer approach to uh, definitions and using just syllogistic logic to win arguments without any regard for the love of truth. The other one is based what you got <laughs> in law school that's yeah. what she got in law school that's what we all get in that, that, yeah I mean, it's a miracle if we if we didn't get that <laughs> in university totally. and um and the other one plato's is entirely based on not giving you ever a satisfying crystallized answer it's a it's about the process and learning how does your mind move when it is fruitful and pursuing uh pursuing the truth right and um and it actually is much more useful to have that approach of just learning how to like smell oh, out. Hold on, I gotta help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sweater is sabotaging you. Um, so that's the, you know, when you look at things like the mind of the founding, of most at least of the founding fathers, Ben Franklin, uh, Hamilton, we talked about in past discussions, yeah, look wow. at the minds of people like John Quincy Adams, Abigail Adams. Abigail Adams was working very hard with John 
uh, Adams, who had a lot of problems, but still, I think John Quincy was was a much more elevated mind than his father. I think his mom played a big role in that. But they had him. How did they train this kid? They they had him translate Plato's dialogues from ancient Greek when he was you know eight, nine, ten years old. They had him not only do that; they had discussions with the family every night about Pl- Plato um, and the Bible. And you know, you're approaching then the Bible with a completely different paradigm than you would if you were just simply taught to um, live by by blind faith in authority. A very different way of thinking. Well said. Right. And the effect of that was to give him opportunities to go and become an, an attache to a diplomatic uh, office in Britain or then in Russia, where he became the ambassador to the, of the U.S. to Russia and opened up so many diplomatic bridges before being sent back after the War of 1812. Uh, and again, he did some miracles while he was up there in, in Russia, becoming a close friend with Tsar Alexander the First. And when he came back, he he always had a super strong sense of the British-run deep state operations inside of the USA that even his father didn't understand properly. And you could see that in their correspondence. It's like, Dad, you got to break with the uh, the British loving here. They they they, they want to kill us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then John Quincy actually he he had relations with. Alexander the first. So then that was the great dictator's father. I mean, the great uh, uh, liberator, the great Alexander the second was the, the great liberator, right? Yeah. Well, there was, and between that, there was uh, Nicholas the first. So there's Alexander the first, Nicholas the first, then Alexander the second, Alexander the third, then Nicholas the second. Um, don't ask me. I think Alexander the first was probably the grandfather, but don't quote me on that of Alexander the second. But that's who Quincy Adams was in. That, that he actually had relations with him in Russia then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's the one who brought Alexander Hamilton's. He's the one who brokered, not even brokered, but organized to have Alexander Hamilton's subject on manufacturers report and also his reports on national banking translated for the first time into Russian Got it. with an understanding that Russia and the USA had a lot of similarities, both in terms of having um, um, a lot of a- land. A lot of land. Yeah, a lot of resources, a lot of land in the, Mer- in the U.S. It was West Coast, the Western frontier to open up. In the case of Russia, it was the East Coast and North in the Arctic. Mm. Um, and the different, you know, the various colleagues of in Russia of John Quincy Adams were all writing correspondences. Some were like this included the interior minister of Russia. Alexander the first was so impressed by this guy that he even asked John Quincy to become the uh, godfather of his son. And John Quincy had ah. to say no because that would create certain diplomatic problems but okay. he wanted to wow um now it's cool he also cool. created uh this idea of um u.s russia industrialization so things like russia's first rail was built by george washington whistler the brother of uh whistler the painter and he was a, a leading rail engineer who was brought into russia to design and build the first rail between moscow and st petersburg in the 1840s and 50s. Again, this was through channels that were built up even after Quincy Adams was became Secretary of State, ret- having returned to the USA and then president. And then, you know, he was continuously a congressman until right. he until he died. Um, he was organizing massive um, idea transfers with Russia and coordinating as much as possible with the better part of the Russian intelligentsia, because you have deep state fifth columns in Russia too, out to destroy Russia from within both today as well as 200 years ago same you know wow. same type of processes as, as what the u.s is facing um but he during that time he also um found a young talent in illinois and that was abraham lincoln and lincoln had his first bout uh, dance with uh, federal politics under the patronage of john quincy adams and together both of them organized for the oh. successful election in 1839 of uh, William Harrison, of uh, the Whig, the first Whig president uh, after after Adams, and uh, and Harrison had, you know, I mean Lincoln. There's there's speeches I have one in the appendix of, of volume one of the Clash of the Two Americas. Lincoln was giving speeches on the need to reinstate a third national bank of yeah, Alexander yeah, Hamilton. That was excellent. Yeah, that was really yeah. good. And this, this was picked up. I, I only discovered that by Nancy Spanis, uh, who's a, a, a Hamilton scholar and uh, has assisted me quite a bit in my research. Um, she, she found this full speech by Lincoln and uh, together him and John Quincy Adams fought against the, the evil, the evil manifest destinyers who wanted to have a, a war of conquer of conquest with Spain and Mexico. 
uh, especially Mexico. And uh, both of them fought against the Mexican War, um, Lincoln and, and Quincy Adams. They got Harrison elected as well on the principle of having a, res a restoration of protectionism after the, the years of destruction caused by Andrew Jackson's destruction of national regulation, protectionism, and, and the National Bank. Harrison was not only going to do these things for the three months he was in office before he dies, right? We don't even, there was never, they didn't have the ability to do a proper autopsy. So no one knows what killed him, but definitely it was not just, you know, a uh, bad sleeper. Yeah. yeah. It was on his desk. Uh, <laughs> yep. And, uh, and he did have on his desk um, a bill to activate a third national bank that had been passed in the Senate and in the Congress of the mm -hmm. USA. And it was just waiting for that executive signing off. And he couldn't make it there because he didn't wake up that morning. So that's that's the type of process that Quincy Adams was a part of. Also, Quincy Adams, too, was um, a major opponent of the slave power and, and you know, was the uh, primary um, defense attorney defending the slaves who rebelled on the Amistad. Probably yeah, one of the only. Right. Yeah. 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 There's a movie by uh, by Spielberg that was half decent uh, that tackled that. Um, and uh, and, you know, he was so he was a lawyer of the best sort, not the type of lawyers that you right. you encountered ready uh, in, well, in a legal school. But yeah. and, and so was Lincoln. And, so was and Lincoln. both of these guys were really driven. Lincoln was a Platonist as well. He loved Plato. He carried around platonic dialogues. He carried around Shakespeare as well. Shakespeare had a very platonic uh -huh. approach to his storytelling. His character development, getting people vicariously into the mind of somebody who is wrong but doesn't know it, who's self-lying, <laughs> like lying to themselves, which is what Plato is doing all the time with his discussions with Sophists. Right. That's what, what, what uh, Shakespeare is doing with the different interplay of, of characters, right? Yeah. Um, except you don't tend to have much of a Socrates. You do sometimes. You sometimes do in the form right. of like, yeah, but not very often. Not as much. <laughs> Yeah, you, but nonetheless, you you get the it's consequence the of bad ideas playing out on a stage, right? Where you're like yeah. walking out of that experience thinking, "I don't want to do that." <laughs> right, 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 totally. uh, I don't want to be Iago. <laughs> no, I don't want, no, exactly. I don't want to be Hamlet. I don't. You know. So, um, that's what was animating a young Lincoln. Um, and and at a certain point, the 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 nation was going to hell. Like there was very similar to our our current situation. You know, the the slave power was was in a dominant position. The the Anglo, uh, city of London, Wall Street power structures of the Eastern establishment, what was called the Boston Brahmins, yeah. was in a complete dominant uh, position in the north. There was rampant demoralization across the board, and it was becoming clear that the U.S. was bankrupt. It was financially unviable um nobody wanted to invest in the u.s dollar like we were talking about there was just you know thousands of different local uh currencies floating around uh, instability out of the wazoo and um you know lincoln had to figure out well what is my role in this process and uh quincy adams had died by this time you know there, there were some good people around the republic like the Whigs which was also being corrupted and taken over as well. So the Whig party was getting weaker and weaker, especially after uh, uh, Zachary Taylor also dies, the last Whig president in 1851. Again, mysterious circumstances. The guy, you know, he had cherries and bad milk or something, or too much cherries and too many cherries and milk, which caused him to die uh, after two years. And they just poison cherries, maybe. <laughs> maybe. You know, they call it food poisoning, eh? And it's like, yeah, well, yeah. you had a food poisoning. That's right. Who poisoned the food? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, mm. <laughs> but um, that's, and so there was out of the better part of the wig, the wigs and some of the, um, the Benton, the Benton uh, Democrats, which again, had good and bad eggs in between. They formed a new party in 1856 um, called the Republican Party. Yeah. And Fremont, that was a party- Fremont. Yeah, hmm? yeah, Fremont was going to, yeah. they first yeah. ran Fremont and that was really fascinating. Captain yeah. Fremont. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I really enjoy his little role in history that a lot of people don't know. It's kind of like Gilpin. He's another one like that a little oh, bit. Yeah. Fremont is. Yeah. Fremont and Gilpin, work, they work together, right? Yeah. On, uh, on opening up the, uh, the West yeah. and uh, trying to do battle against British stooges from Canada and, and other things. Uh, that were all vying for who's going to control the Colorado, or not Colorado, sorry, the um, the Oregon Territory. Right. And what would and, be the and, ruler and, of the U.S.? Huh? Yeah, and Fremont, he, he had married Benton's daughter. 
and and obviously politically they didn't actually see eye to eye if i recall and when i was re i researched him a while back but it was it was an interesting study about about that guy yeah yeah well you know he also both of these guys they worked very closely they were they were given pretty high responsibility during the start of the civil war under lincoln yeah. um so you know uh, captain fremont didn't win um the 1856 elections but things were so bad that come 1860 uh 61 or 60 um there was obviously just it was it was in total disarray the the southern states basically took themselves out of the electorate the electorate uh that gave the the ability for the republicans to finally gain control now they had lincoln as their man um seward was going to be the main guy but william seward was albeit a, a good man he was also a, a bit he was a weaker personality than, than Lincoln. I think it was recognized by those uh, in the Republican Party that Seward, though he had more support uh, politically, he didn't have the what it took necessarily to execute the type of fight that needed to be fought. And Lincoln did demonstrate a very strong capacity to do this. So uh, Fremont was given um, a very high position of responsibility, as was uh, William Gilpin, another former uh, Bentonite who yeah. became a leading Republican, um, the only a Republican, actually, because at the time, the, the Democratic Party was the party of slavery and Wall Street. Right. And it was um, the Republicans who were the, the party of, of freedom um, and emancipation. Right. That was something and people say, oh, but Lincoln, there's a quote, you know, where he writes to, I think, the editor of uh, I forget which new, news, uh, the New York, I forget which newspaper um, where, you know, Lincoln famously says, if I could uh, keep the, save the union without freeing any freeing any slaves, I would do it. And so people say, oh, but that means yeah, he didn't really slaves. care about freeing slavery and it's like, or freeing slaves. Right. It's like, well, that's out of context. First of all, you're ignoring yeah. 30 years of his speeches, fights, legislative yeah. uh, battles to uh, free slaves, which he had been consistent about for yeah. 30 years before that, you know, that yeah. one correspondence, again, completely out of context. Yeah. And I and, think that, that you laid that out so well through the Frederick Douglass part in your book where he like talks to Lincoln about that, you know, where he was like, but he, it almost made him understand his dedication to like keep the union together even more. Like he resected him more, even though he said he would do it, whether he could abolish slavery or not, you know, like it, like it mattered. Like, I don't know. It was really well described. Well, that, that was, that was the Cynthia Chung uh, uh, chapter in, in the. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cynthia is going to yeah. kick out of that. Hey, she she would kick my ass if I took credit for that. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, no, that's 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 a wonderful example of a, of a good man who is, you know, Frederick Douglass is an incredible, powerful soul. And he is somebody who is his own man. And for a while, he was under the sway of the abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison. And uh, and he broke with the abol he broke with William Lloyd Garrison. It didn't mean that he became promoter of slavery because he broke with the abolitionists. No, he just recognized that William Lloyd Garrison is pushing to dissolve the the union and he's like why are why are you know i i appreciate you you know uh working with me and, and helping me you know spread the word of freedom but why are you saying that we should rip up the constitution and that the constitution is intrinsically a slave document um i never actually he's like i never actually read it <laughs> and he's like i actually i got down and i decided to read this thing um after um a few years and i was like why wow, I, I actually can't see anything that is embedded in it that uh, protects the institution of slavery as a forever institution. If anything, the solutions for the freedom of all people are there. And Frederick Douglass, like Lincoln, importantly, saw that slavery wasn't just enslaving the black people, but that the white slave owner was himself also a slave to his system. Oh, um, that's the key right wow, there, man. Yeah. That's it. That was yeah. super key. And, and so when he finally met Lincoln, he realized, okay, there, Lincoln's got a different long, he's thinking long game here. He's thinking about a much more wise approach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, William Lloyd Garrison was completely, and we've discovered by, by people like Anton Chaikin over the years who did work, who proved that people like uh, Garrison was an, an agent of the crown, uh, subversively working to destroy the union from the North um, as part of a, a young, kind of affiliated with the young America movement of Walt, Ralph Waldo mm -hmm. Emerson and, and those in the North, the transcendentalist school, for example, who were trying to promote the idea that, you know, the U.S. is built on a fallacy and we could only correct the fallacy by 
letting the slave states become their own confederate nation, have their own constitution, we'll just get rid of our constitution and, and make our own confederation of the north allied with Britain, and we'll be the clean, no slave people allied again to Britain, and, this, and the slave power to the north will be their own confederation, again, allied to Britain. And uh, it was a gang counter gang operation. It was it was always a divide to conquer thing. Mm. And um, the reality was, and, and Lincoln and, and Frederick Douglass and, and John Quincy Adams understood this, that there had to be a fight over that principled issue. You couldn't just agree to disagree and mm. walk the other way. You had to fight it out because it would result in an eventual war between the South and the North. And British grand strategists like Lord... Uh, Gascoigne Cecil, who was the the, uh, the prime minister during the Civil War, the late phase, was um, openly saying that the North exhibits, that the British Empire cannot work with the North, but we, we are in complete coherence with the right. constitution of the South, of Jefferson Davies, Albert Pike, right. the, the eventual, you know, uh, clear. <laughs> yeah. KKK founder, Knights of the Golden yeah, yeah, Circle, Freemasonic Southern Right operative, that guy. Uh, all of these guys, you know, Jefferson Davis, um, you know, uh, Judah Benjamin, uh, George Sanders. These were all operatives within the Franklin Pierce administration of the 1850s, all of them. And Franklin Pierce's administration was really a young, Euro a young America operation. And all of these guys, including Albert Pike, Sanders, others, were all connected to... Um, Giuseppe Mazzini, who yeah. was a high level um, Mason. Yeah, Freemason in Italy who had organized, innovated a new way. And I think we talked about this a little bit last time we had our, our, one of our conversations was weapon. How do you weaponize yeah, the young, is. abused, disenfranchised young people of any nation and use them as weapons, battering rams of mass mob movements, Oof. nominally for freedom and equality, but ultimately for destroying their own nation state on behalf of um social engineers and you had movements of this all over europe destabilizing europe you had this in again america with the the young america southern branch which was the entire confederate uh you know leadership and you had this with the northern mm -hmm. transcendentalists people that people you know when you look at what was edgar Allan poe doing battle with culturally it was against this uh false spiritual literary movement around Wolf, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, Thoreau later on, and, and many others of the Transcendentalist Networks, they, they were all following this idea that, that our, our, our freedom is, or our liberties are something which is purely based upon our autonomy and right to be left alone and do whatever we want and, and basically express our, our will to power. This is before Nietzsche, but this is basically the overarching view to express our own um, will into the world that is what gives us our rights and waldo emerson wrote his young america manifesto where he explicitly says that the constitution is is part of the old wisdom it's part don't trust anybody over 30 type logic uh we got to let it go and create something new um but it's all based on this atomization of the individual the confederacy was no they they said you know we have to create a union but that union has to be premised around preserving the institution of slavery, which they enshrined in the Confederate Constitution, had it gone into effect. Article one of <laughs> people say, oh, it would have disappeared over time. That's what haters of Lincoln say. If, if he didn't do the war, it would have just diminished over time. Slavery would have just gone away. They enshrined it in Article one of the of the Confederate Constitution that no law shall ever be passed that allows for the liberation of any slave ever. Like, come on. Oh, yeah, that was going to go away. No. No, and they also uh, call for the the dismantling of the Supreme Court, kind of like what the, uh, the you know we see this know. Soros funded operate operations right now. Yeah. Um, they also called explicitly for the government never to legally have any per permissible role to play in directing economic affairs ever. Um, so this is what Lincoln had to contend with, contend with was this doctrine. And he did it in a variety of ways, but he wasn't able to fully put online the Third National Bank, though we know he wanted to, mm -hmm. but he had a lot to contend with. And the way he got around it, because he had what, you know, he, he when the war uh, was basically launched, and it wasn't him who launched the war, it was the South that instigated that war, right? People say, oh yeah, he launched the war, the big tyrant. It's like, no, I think it's pretty much common knowledge that the South launched the war, you know, <laughs> um, but he had to then fund it. How was he going to fund it? Well, 
according to the, the Wall Street and London banks, they were going to give them loans happily, but at 25, 30% interest. So that was not going to work out for very long. Sure. Um, the, the economy was in total disarray. The, the powers of taxation were, were minimal because there was not a lot of production going around. Taxation only kind of is a useful thing if you have people who are in abundance, who are doing well, you know, <laughs> otherwise not so good. Can't, you know, of course, right? <laughs> or I don't know if you built courses. Anyway, you get my gist. <laughs> no, 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 that's true. Um, so you had Albert Gallatin, the, the grandson of, of the first Gallatin, who was a trader working with Aaron Burr to destroy the USA back in, ironically, with a, a, a confederation plot as well to dissolve the union back in 1804, 1800, 1804, 1807. Burr and, and Gallatin worked very hard to bust up the union into a northern and southern confederacy. That, that failed largely because of Alexander Hamilton. Who got killed for it but uh albert gallatin who was then the head of the new york association of banks proposed to lincoln he said okay we'll help you out you just gotta increase taxes um you gotta deposit all of the federal gold in wall street banks you have to end all regulation and you have to withdraw all government what little government paper currencies out there you have to withdraw it all and if you do that the, the wall street banks will will treat you well um that was not going to fly either. No. Um, so it took a little while, but what, what was done in 1862, 1863 were the, uh, the Banking and Currency Acts. Yeah. So this is where, for the first time, a, a federal charter was placed upon the, uh, the state banks. And again, thousands of state banks, a lot of counterfeit currencies too are going around, obviously. There was a 10% tax on banknotes. You had um, reserve requirements were, were forced into law for the first time. So... Now, all of a sudden, the state banks had to have certain reserves. They couldn't just issue currency. You had to, they, they capped the interest rates, so you couldn't do usury anymore. So interest rates had to stay reasonable and low. That was also a big part of taking control back from the, those who wanted to divide it up. Right. And then you also had to have um, the directors of the banks had to be living in the state where the state bank existed. Because up until then, most of the, the state banks were run by directors in New York or abroad. And right. so a law was passed saying that at least 75% of all bank directors had to live in this state to have some vested interest in that state. That forced a massive overhaul of the banks. And finally, he forced the, the banks to, to put one third of their uh, capital into the US Treasury in exchange for treasury notes. And those treasury notes essentially became known as greenbacks. So this, this was part of what fueled the emission then of the greenback system in 1862, where the government through the treasury began to emit, as a national bank is assigned to do, according to Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, yeah. notes that were then the basis upon which the loans to industry, to entrepreneurs, to the financing of bigger projects, to the paying of the soldiers, the buying of supplies and munitions, what, that was allowed to happen. And this grew to about a half of all of the currency by 1865 in, in the USA was these greenbacks. And on top of that, then he issued in 1863 what's called the, uh, the 520 bonds. This is another big thing that right. is done. This is what was, it works. World War II, I did believe. Was that? World War II, they did bonds. That's the victory bond principle of the World War II. You get, every, you, yeah. get, you get the American citizens themselves to become investors in their nation's well-being. Right. And so you offer good uh, you know, good returns, interest on people investing in a $50 bond, a hundred dollar bond, and they could choose whether they get a bond that matures in five years, in 10 or in 20 years. In the case of the 520 bonds, it was five or 20 years. That's a lot. That's a pretty long-term perspective. Yeah. yeah. And that works if you are creating economic activity, which is anti-inflationary in modus, right? Anti-inflationary debt creation. Now people today would say, oh, that's impossible. All debt creation is inflationary. No. Because if you invest in things that create abundance, right, you invest wisely in building things like the Transcontinental Railway, which was begun in 1863. The effect of doing that isn't just to create a railway. It, it yeah, it creates a railway. But what else? What else does it create? Well, industry you know, all along industry, the way, <laughs> yeah, jobs, all of it. You exactly, and you're open up now new markets. You're creating new markets that didn't exist. You're creating new cities along the way. Um, you're opening up the door as well to new mining operations that you would not have had any access to because no rail, no road, doesn't matter that you got like a deposit of gold, doesn't matter, can't get it, it's not useful. So you need to have that type of uh, infrastructure 
to uh, that that has all sorts of nonlinear, and then also most importantly, is the the minds of people who then have to solve problems because you're building something that is impossible. You got to over you got to burrow through mountains. You got to overcome canyons. You got to get across mm. raging rivers. You got to do all sorts of things that are in it from an engineering standpoint impossible. So what makes the 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 impossible become possible is the human human discoveries. And people have to come up with new, that's what made a Da Vinci work, right? Is, is him trying to figure out how do I finalize the building of the, the Santa Maria del Fiore Dome in Florence, which was an engineering impossibility. Even today, they don't know how they properly did it because uh, we lost our knowledge of, of some of the, the principles of physical space time that people like Da Vinci and his colleagues had access to that allowed for, like, that's why this thing is like Santa Maria del Fiore. This thing took 200 years to build. It is to this very day the world's biggest uh, mason dome in existence. We've never gone bigger. We don't know how it was done. We can't reverse engineer it. The best engineers today who are trained probably off of mostly computer models. That's why they don't really know how these great minds were thinking. And uh, But it was done. And the effect of it being done allowed for an upshift in the psycho-spiritual cultural uh, norms of that society that allowed for a fertile soil that could then activate um, new political changes that had never happened before. Mm-hmm. And that was sort of the, the same process that you'd had out of the, the transcontinental railway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you, you know, you, you bring up the best and the brightest. That was JFK's idea around the sure. space program two of Apollo, right? You're going to create mm-hmm. clear objectives that can allow us to measure the best, uh, the best and the brightest ideas that we have and also prove wrong through action ideas that might have looked good but are actually false and useless when you try to do something. Yeah. If you do nothing, like in our case, 50 years now into post-industrial consumer wasteland, we have been <laughs> we're, we're doing not jack nothing, right? So all of these bad ideas are, are given respect because oh. we're not testing out on the universe which ideas of quantum theory are right or wrong. Maybe they're all wrong. Maybe all standard model quantum mechanics are all equally wrong. And we just don't know because we're not trying to do shit, right? <laughs> um that's so cool. that's, the, that's the beauty of what Lincoln was doing. And yeah. in the course of that process, again, he was able to take back he, he, what, what was, I think, something to the effect of like, um, how many banks? It was uh, 14,000 banks in 1861, all controlling their own emissions of, of uh, currencies. That was reduced down to simply 290 banks by 1865. Yeah, so he was one step closer when he won his second term you know, leading up towards the victory of the Civil War, he won a second term. He was on the on the cusp of finalizing now his the, the thing he fought for with John Quincy Adams 34 years earlier, which was activate now, make it a proper national banking structure um, until he was shot. Ah. And uh, and that derailed quite a bit because as soon as he was shot, his enemies had already positioned Andrew Johnson who is you know, a very small, kind of like a proto George Bush Jr. type of character to right. be the guy as his vice president who would take over, kind of like a Harry Truman. As well. you, you tend to find that yeah. great presidents getting shot usually have had some jackass Anglophile. <laughs> yeah. McKinley. Yeah, McKinley absolutely. as well got Theodore Roosevelt. It's great. Yeah, Confederate loving idiot who loved the British Empire. Um, and that's what took over. And, and immediately there was a war on the Greenbacks. The Greenbacks were increasingly destroyed with the Species Resumption Act which on the surface people are like, well, people have said, oh, but that was good because it, it, you know, it, it bound the U.S. currency to gold and that's good. Gold is good. And it's like, well, gold may or may not be good because if you're forcing the currency issuance to be on, on par with a one-to-one ratio on gold that you could exchange like one denomination of, of the U.S. currency with this amount of gold always, and, a, and if that's what you're limiting it to, well, who controls the gold? That's right. what it's um, all about. Yeah. It yeah. was with the petrol dollar. It was similar then. It was almost like a petrol dollar back then with gold. It was exactly that. Yeah. And it was right. the, and London controlled, it, you know, the, the pound sterling also was gold backed. And, the, and London controlled uh, the, gold, the gold commodities exchange markets and were able to, through speculation, create a highly volatile situation with gold by artificially purchasing or selling to affect the price not only of gold, but then how many, how many US dollars could exist and be, be circulated which again had the same effect of what Andrew Jackson had done by taking uh, currency out of circulation that would have otherwise gone towards building up industries, science, R&D, and other things. That was all gone. 
And again, you had, though you had Ulysses S. Grant, who was able to, to try to pull things back together as much as he could for the two terms he, can't, he was in after Andrew Johnson. Despite that, he was still not capable of carrying out a lot of the, like, you know, he, he did crush the KKK and the, and the Albert Pike operation. The first, you know, intelligence agency funded uh, domestic terror movement was, was Albert Pike. And he was able to, you know, Ulysses S. Grant was able to go far in crushing that thing before it really got out of hand. But reconstruction after you, after Grant was completely sabotaged. Big time. And that whole plan, like, you know, you had black people winning uh, elected op- official seats in South Carolina. You know, you could look at the, the lineup of, yeah. of black people who had become elected officials in South Carolina in the 1870s. And it's a long list. And I, it surprised me. Um, many of these Southern states were, were electing black people to the Senate and Congress uh, on, the, on the state level. And uh, you're like, why is it that by 1880, all of that's gone? What happened? I had no idea. I got to look that up. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're, you'd be fascinated. There's, there's names. There's, there's so many oh. names that will just blow your mind. Uh, uh, Blanche Kelso Bruce and Robert uh, Smalls and John Ray Lynch. Uh, these were all like former slaves who like won elected office right after the Civil War. Oh, yeah. yeah. And this is what defines then McKinley, right? Because McKinley right. is coming in. And, um, you know, I obviously we could have talked more about like the operations that killed Lincoln from Montreal, Canada and, and how, That's you know, fascinating. yeah, you I mean, read the book for that. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess yeah, what read the book. too is, is how they took out, um, what Garfield and then, uh, Alexander, Alexander, the, the second, what almost within a couple months of each other or months. Yeah. 1880. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that was, that was part of the, uh, the big first wave, uh, right after Lincoln, it became really an age of assassinations. And a lot of these assassinations were being carried out by, um, anarchist operations that operate in cells and cells within cells under the, the Giuseppe Mazzini young Europe model, but yeah, reformed with a little bit of tweaks here and there um, by the 1870s, eighties. And this is what, yeah, this is what launched a bomb killing uh, Tsar Alexander II, the great liberator. Also yeah. the guy who saved, he went far to save Lincoln and the union by deploying the, the Russian Navy to the coast of the USA that turned the tide in favor of the USA of, or of, of, of Lincoln um, as a direct message to, you know, France and, and Britain to not go in gung ho and uh, fight alongside the Confederate South, which is what they were prepared to do with uh, Napoleon III's forces stationed all across the Mexican border waiting to join in from the South and 10,000 British troops stationed in Canada um, waiting to invade from the North uh, while the Civil War is happening, while you have terrorist operations run by the Confederate Secret Service. Um, basings in Montreal, Toronto, carrying out the Albany raids, raids on Baltimore, hmm. raids on Philadelphia, Detroit, the whole time. There's like Lincoln not just dealing with the, the northern southern Confederacy. He's got these northern operations too. You got banking warfare operations, so many different aspects to this thing. A lot of moving parts. So he's got to have a very multifaceted mode of thinking about, you know, navigating through the storm. I think Shakespeare helped him on that because he did memorize Shakespeare and Plato and the Bible. Um, these things gave him like a strong compass to, uh, sure. have a certain create cause he's a funny guy too. You could read his, his, his writings and, and he's able to just crack jokes in the craziest situations. And I think that attitude <laughs> yeah. kind of like Ben Franklin had that attitude too. It, it really helps. JFK had it. He was, yeah. he's a joke maker. Yeah. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah. Do what you gotta do. Um, and, yeah, that's, uh, that is really fascinating. Cause when you think about what he was up against, and obviously he had to have as many good allies, you know, Lincoln had to have enough good people he could trust to pull off some of the things he did. And he did obviously have enough, at least in the first term. I think the second term he was trying to, I just think he was trying to appease the South and not lose the South. Once the war was over, he might've had a, a few more in there that might've been a bit more sketchy in the second. Well, term. he definitely had uh I mean, one of his philosophies, people call him like the great pragmatist because um, he kept his enemies so close, you know, um, but he had a, a deeper spiritual strength. And he talked about how, you know, when he was asked about why do you have your enemies close to you? And he said, well, you know, you I, I destroy my enemies by making them my friends. 
Uh, man. Which was nice. a lifelong philosophy. And, and he had a power, a, a certain yeah. sense of his power of converting, uh, converting others by being, um, and I like, like being a, a fundamentally wise and good person, you know, and, yeah, and being yeah, playful. Totally. Yeah, he's in touch with his play, his play power. Yeah. And by having that, you can, you can find awaken the humanity in people who have really gone down the path of uh, maliciousness a little bit too long. You could still, you could still pull it out. Sure. Um, and it was transformative. We did find a lot of his enemies, his political enemies did still continue. I mean, some of them didn't, and some of them worked hard to sabotage right. the good he did, but some of them actually did rise to the occasion after he died. Um, and did fight to continue on his policy. Now, um, one thing to keep in mind here too is that when he dies, um, President Johnson, who again is largely a shithead, largely, <laughs> but he does have a certain obligation to respond to reality, and it was much more well known that that the that it was not a lone gunman that killed Lincoln. Today, it's that's confused. But uh, Johnson issued a proclamation, probably written by somebody else, uh, t- I think like two days after Lincoln dies, saying that it appears from evidence. I just, I just found this quote as you guys, as we were talking. It appears from evidence in the Bureau of Military Justice that the murder of Abraham Lincoln was incited, concerted, and procured by and between Jefferson Davis, late of Richmond, Virginia, and Jacob Thompson, um, who was the interior minister under, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, up there in Canada? No, Franklin Pierce, President Pierce. Oh, Pierce. President Pierce. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Clement C. Clay, uh, Beverly Tucker, George Saund- Sanders, who was the, the young America Mazzini ally who was the ambassador from under Pierce to uh, Great Britain mm. uh, under Pierce's regime. That's mm. George Sanders. He ran the Canadian operations with Thompson. Right. Uh, William Cleary and other rebels and traitors against the government of the United States harbored in Canada. That's the, the direct, direct quote by Johnson. Um, and then Edward Stanton, um, two days before uh, the shootout um, that allegedly killed Booth, but there's never been a body, so who knows. But uh, Edward Stanton, who's the Secretary of War under Lincoln, writes, this department has information that the president's murder was organized in Canada and approved at Richmond, Virginia. Dang. So right there, you know, you have uh, a strong... American intelligence, the Union intelligence operations had mapped out the entire network of Anglo-Canadian intel that was working with the Confederacy, um, especially in Montreal. And this is where John Wilkes Booth spent four weeks receiving his money. We know that the money as well, Anton Shakin did a a short write-up because Wilkes Booth in his possession had a $500 uh, check cut out to him from Henry Starnes, who was the president of the Canadian Bank of Ontario, based in Montreal, um, who right after the Civil War became was awarded for services to empire by becoming the mayor of Montreal. This is who had the direct directly signed Booth's uh, check before he was sent back down to uh, to Canada, or maybe it was mailed to him. I'm not too sure, but he was in Canada for four weeks um, in these circles at what's called St. Lawrence, St. Lawrence Hall. It's still there in the old port. I can walk to it. It takes me an hour. Um, that was the, the official basing operations and, uh, the money itself was part of a bigger tranche of cash that was sent by wire transfer from London by none other than, um, what's his name? Um, oh, James D. Bullock. That's him. James D. Bullock. Now this guy's going to be important here because James D. Bullock sent $32,000 in a wire transfer to the bank of Ontario. Um, At this time, Bullock was the head of the Confederate secret intelligence operations in Europe based in England. Hmm. And he was the uncle of. I know this. (laughs) I I just knew where you were going. I like when I know where you're going sometimes. Go ahead, do it, do it. Who is he? Yeah. (laughs) He's the uncle of Teddy Roosevelt. And Roosevelt, Teddy, um, works, he idolizes Bullock. Um, so much so that he ends up, he's, he's like, um, basically the mentee. So he's Bullock's takes him under his wing since he's a young man, romanticizes the, uh, the genteel Southern way hates Lincoln. Um, though often won't say so publicly cause he's still nominally a Republican and uh, he helps Bullock, uh, with his papers in co and in putting together Bullock's papers that he then uses to write the 1883, um, 
sort of a, a, a um, the secret services of the Confederate States of Europe book, um, which sort of sanitizes the entire Confederate intel operations with Britain. So T- Teddy Roosevelt, he becomes, yeah, as you said, right, the, the, the vice president under William McKinley, who's the last um, Civil War general, like president. So the president, the last president who fought in the Civil War um, is McKinley. He gets assassinated in September 1901. And as soon as he's assassinated, the guy who was his vice president for like six months or something, you know, because it's his second term, uh, now becomes president, who's an Anglophile um, closet, Southern Confederate pro-slavery adherent to or a disciple to his uncle Bullock. Mm. And um, he now becomes the president. And he's also mm. a eugenicist. He, he's a oh. lover of mm. the, the pseudoscience of eugenics. Uh, specifically uh, with it with a strong hate for the black skinned races the natives every everybody pretty much who isn't white but also white people who are just statistically poorer and thus you know perhaps having on average lower iqs not because of their genetics of course which we know now but in the mind of a eugenicist it's just because that's it's it's your it, it's not your your economic injustice or your your circumstances that cause a tendency for criminal acts or low IQ as if IQ was even a standard of, of intelligence, which it's not, but they'll say it's because of your blood. You're, you're just in, biologically inferior and thus should be sterilized. And he was a big promoter of that. He was also a big promoter of um, cutting off territory from uh, technological growth, specifically all of the, the nature reserves on the West Coast. Um, and that also includes uh, using native reserves as an excuse to expand and um, anti-development regions that would block the development of dams of water projects or rail that was supposed to happen that did not happen uh, because of these things. Um, that was, again, Teddy Roosevelt conducted an ecological uh, protectionist revolution. But again, these things were, they seem good, but they didn't really want to, they didn't care about protecting nature. They were modeling their acts, these acts that were done in the U.S. under what Britain had done in India in the 1870s under the nature reservation protocols of the British empire in India that had allocated big chunks of Indian land for nature reserves gaming so that the Indians themselves couldn't develop dams or technology in those zones to alleviate poverty, which the British wanted as part of their Malthusian agenda to keep the population underdeveloped starving, you know, and that was part of that more of that eco imperialism. Yeah. It's the same thing. That's totally, that was what was important to the USA. Yep. And an actual official imperialism by by creating the first for the first time that's under Teddy Roosevelt that was the first Anglo-American special relationship you know where there's like he commissioned stamps with him and King Edward the Seventh um, yeah, Edward that. Albert um, together yeah. on the stamp together or is it Edward the Seventh yeah it's Edward the Seventh yeah. uh, mm-hmm. together on the stamp together um, saying you know uni- united in the white man's burden. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, people blame McKinley for a lot of the things um, in his administration because there, there was imperial acts. There was a fight over whether America was going to become um, an, would, would it be governed by an, an evil Roman Empire manifest destiny like a Pax Americana of subduing the savages and, and ex- extending the white man's burden over the world? A la Cecil Rhodes, you know, would, would that be the orientation or, or Andrew Jackson? Would that be the orientation or would it be based upon the idea of extending the rights of developing the universal sentiments and powers to everybody uh, while respecting their, you know, uh, their differences? Right. There was a big fight. And McKinley, when you look at his, his work consistently, he was always of the better manifest destiny doctrine that America must never become an empire. Uh, that it must work with other nations to develop their full resources and their people, uh, and and America should should help. That's why uh, McKinley made sure that the USA did not take part and actually resisted the concessions, the carving up of China after the Boxer Rebellion. He worked with uh, his colleagues like Sergei Vita in Russia, the mm-hmm. finance minister, who was a big, uh, you know, um, follower of Alexander Hamilton and Friedrich List who advanced the building of the Trans-Siberian Railway modeled on Lincoln's Railway. And McKinley was, was constantly in collaboration with, with Vita um, on doing this together and extending that through Mongolia right. into China as part of a, a Sino-Russian uh, right. deal that was being funded by colleagues in France, as well as 
a, a better American industrialists who wanted to break the world free of British Empire. Now, sometimes there was also bad things. There was a war with Cuba. There was, uh, or that involved Cuba. There was also um, the war that also brought the U.S. into a terrible situation in the Pacific around the Philippines and, and Spain. Ninety-eight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you look at well, yes. These things were sparked under McKinley's presidency, but at the same time, when you dig into it, McKinley was not, he had done everything possible to keep America out of that. It was when Teddy Roosevelt, who was under secretary of the Navy for like a four hour period, um, while the actual official secretary was, was out and out of state on, on some weird excursion, he was like pulled out of Washington. Teddy Roosevelt (laughs) was the guy who triggered the war that got the U.S. enmeshed. That's Philippines. why they gave him. Hey, that's why they gave him the VP and then the presidency. Oh, They're like, hey, this guy, this guy talent. They're like, this guy has got what it takes. And I, make it's, stuff up. I know you can't. <laughs> you cannot make it up. It's like, oh my god. It's why, and I, I, I forget the details. I, I studied this a few years ago, and it's just popping in my head now that I'm thinking back at it. But I'm, I'm going to send some material to you guys. Um, going through this story, I think Anton Chaikin did some work on this, or was it Bob Ingram? Anyway, I'll send you some stuff on this. But yeah, there's a whole. Yeah wacky story there and um you know like who was it it was um um the vice president because because at the time still you know like there were there was people like james blaine who was a a secretary of state he almost became president who was a good man who had Mm. worked very hard against this deep state operation throughout the 1880s 1890s trying to keep lincoln's spirit alive he he worked very hard to get mckinley elected um and Teddy Roosevelt was still such a shithead. Nobody respected this guy, but he had protectors that I don't fully understand who saw his talent launching this war. Um, and McKinley, yeah, like he, once the war was something unstoppable, his, his desire was to try to finish it as quickly as possible. He didn't want to create a globally extended American empire. And you, again, you could see it through his acts in per, following the war and also what he did with, with China, with South America, by doing things that that kicked the British out of South America by bringing in the, the McKinley tariff, the British uh, embassy uh, officials in, in the USA were complaining to their home office that the, the that British uh, banking couldn't have any couldn't get their foot in the door after the McKinley tariff and the, the treaties of reciprocity with by James Blaine and McKinley with uh, Central uh, South America, as well as increasingly with Canada, um, which is a big prize was, was to win over Canada from the British, which was almost going to happen. So there was this whole thing going Mm -hmm. on. It's not like America wanted to just subdue, like kick out Britain so that they could control South America or Canada at the time. Like, look, McKinley died at the uh, Pan American conference. Mm -hmm. And at that conference in September, 1901, he was fighting for developing um, rail and infrastructure for all South America to help South America industrialize, to connect the Panama Canal, to, you know, to fin- finalize and then to even build rail through the Panama Canal zone. Um, all of these things were things he was fighting for. Um, so he had that going the day that he was shot. And the person who shot him, if you carry, if you look again, keeping in mind these anarchist networks that were killing, I got another, did, did I have a quote here? I don't know if I do. Oh, maybe I don't. This gruntled painter, they called him. <laughs> yeah, I forgot Grunt his name. Painter. But he was a disciple of Emma Goldman. Right. And that, he was in those circles. Emma Goldman. I don't know that. She was like, um, she had like a cult following. She had a cult of anarchists, was supporting the, uh, yeah, she was. Author and, yeah, she's, she's an author. Um, she was part of the Neil Malthusian League as well with Bertrand uh-huh. Russell. And it was actually after she was arrested because this guy, Leon forgetting his name anyway uh Ch- 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 Guts or something anyway he's the guy who he had been listening to all of her speeches he had been like going to her she had like a commune as well and so she was arrested after the uh, the assassination of mckinley and uh and the person who sponsored or so who sponsored the what's called the it's called the henry street settlement house that was sort of the anarchist you know proto-socialist uh, beachhead where all of these these freaks were getting their ideas and being deployed to carry out operations. Um, that's where Emma Goldman was based. They they were funded primarily by Jacob Schiff and uh, Sir Ernst Cassell. Ernst Cassell was the, the primary banker for the royal family and one of Jacob Schiff's leading colleagues. 
Um, they worked together in tons of projects. Together, they funded uh, the 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 they funded the Japanese military in the uh, the the Japanese war against Russia in 1904. He funded the the first and second and third waves of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1905, 1917. Jacob Schiff. He was part of the 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 grouping that funded the the Federal Reserve. The entire operation that put the Federal Reserve into play in 1913 was Jacob Schiff. This guy was part of, uh, again, a high-level pro-British establishment operation embedded in the USA with nominally American names, but not really. Um, so this is the guy who's funding the, the Henry Street Settlement House. <laughs> when she's in prison, Emma Goldman, she's her journey out of prison, her, her, her bail, and then her, her journey to London, which is where she lives out her, you know, for the next years, is sponsored by Bertrand Russell in 1902 or something. Um, again, neo Malthusian League. So this whole operation, it's a multifaceted operation. It had killed, like there were, there were uh, you know, Sidi Carnot, the president of France, killed by anarchists. Uh, Henry, Alexander II, we already talked about. Um, early, that month, uh, President Garfield, who also had a battle plan to uh, attack and destroy the British Navy, President Garfield, like who knows that? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are so many. There was the, the, the Empress of uh, the Queen of, of Austria, um, Eugenie, who, who was also assassinated around the same time. Um, oh God, it's, it's a long list. I got to say, it's it was a real... You know, how they were able to have so many tentacles and like to deal with so many different areas through so many different means, like all around the same time through these, like, like it's, it's amazing that they were able to succeed at all of it. Like it, it's brilliant. And it's, it's, it's well, I don't know, scariness. I don't even know what the word Well, there's is. definitely like, yeah, it, it's, it's um, part of a temper tantrum. An oligarchical temper tantrum is that if you can't win the game, you, you kick over the chessboard. And that was the age of assassinations. It's just, Launch wow. chaos, try to pick up the order after the chaos. And it's a bit of a risk for the empire when they have to do that because there's no guarantee. It's like today, right? Like we're at a point we're where right the, there. Yeah, the Eurasian Economic Union, the multipolar alliance is not giving up the way it was supposed to. They were supposed to already have given up their sovereignty and submitted to a one world government. And they were going to be rewarded, hands, or at least their, their elites were going to be rewarded handsomely by playing along with the new world order objective and slowly depopulating their societies the way they were all supposed to. And that was, that was the script 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they're not abiding by the script. So increasingly the, the rules of the great game are being challenged today. And um, the oligarchy is increasingly getting hectic. We see this in Ukraine. We see this around China and the Pacific. We see this in the U S itself everywhere. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're acting rashly out of and it's like a wounded animal which is, means a very dangerous animal and they have nuclear weapons today too right. um but if they were to unleash the type of chaos that we're talking about here as a worst case scenario today there's no guarantee that they're going to come out of that dominant they i mean okay. nuclear nuclear exchanges and bombs everywhere is likely going to wipe out most of the oligarchy um same pro i mean they didn't have nuclear weapons back in the 18 90s however it was still like if you look at the consequence of the age of assassinations the destruction of qualified leaders across europe and north america yeah. that then allowed for the climate of um the triggering of not only the bolshevik color revolution which was i'm sorry to say for those who like the bolshevik revolution no it was a color revolution funded by jacob schiff max vorberg uh, lord Stay. milner um that's provable um to overthrow and topple the movement of the hamiltonians and frederick list devotees in Russia around Alexander II, III, and Sergei Vita, who were working with McKinley. Um, that's what that's what that thing was about. And you're lucky there. I mean, you know, we're lucky as human humanity that Trotsky didn't finally come out as the dictatorial leader that he was expected to be. He was the favored dominant force. He was supposed to be, there was never supposed to be a Stalin. So thank God he didn't win that. And it created a situation where there was a viable Russia by the 1930s for, for Roosevelt to work with. Had it been Leon Trotsky, he was, he was more than happy to work with Hitler and Mussolini and turn Russia into a slave labor uh, basket case society. The, that, that was Trotsky's job. And the fact that the, the, you know, the modern day neoconservative movement was sparked by a bunch of Trotskyists like J James Burnham. Isn't that, isn't that something? It's not a coincidence. Who would believe that? No, Irving Kristol, uh, Albert Volstetter, like these were all Trotskyists. 
they are the ones who created the neoconservative right. movement that that took over like a virus, the the Republican Party, and the Republican Party. It, it lost its Lincoln McKinley traditions under this post, you know, post 1945 uh, right. takeover of the Trotskyists who turned it into this weird Pat Buchanan uh, in the seventies, but then it became more weird and weirder and weirder with uh, the futurists, um, you know, taking it, taking it even further. And uh, Bush Cheney, Zbigniew, all these guys ended up just converting this thing into this, crazy thing until trump came along yeah the chick um, the chicken hawks you know what's interesting it's like they're we're both getting the word like you're seeing how the right and the left are just completely showing have both been infiltrated both turning into something that they're not they're becoming neoconservatives neoliberal it's all neo-imperialism once again yeah. really maybe yeah. that's maybe that's part of it maybe that's exactly what needed to happen is uh, because everybody who bought into the left right psyop just got caught up arguing with their brother or their dad or their cousin over stuff that they were laughing at us that we were fighting over it they were totally laughing at us the whole time. exactly no we we totally fell for a joke an oligarchical sick joke and yeah the democratic party as well got infiltrated with its own variants so you know there you had the fabian society operatives um the enemies of jfk who took control of the of the Democratic Party, uh, even though he was trying to revive the Lincoln spirit by reviving His Roosevelt, party. because Roosevelt had had basically given a speech in 1932 saying the Republican Party has become the party of Wall Street, and he was right. Um, it had lost the the Lincoln mandate, and he said we have to take con take back the um the the helm of Lincoln from the Republicans and renew the Democratic Party under the Lincoln mandate. So it's not a question of what party, right? People get confused right. about party football totally. politics. And it's like, no, it's about the principle. And that's what JFK was reviving with protectionism, state-directed credit, um, large-scale internal improvements, scientific and technological progress. The, 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 the common theme is open systems, that it was all premised on the idea that we could always create more abundance than we were born into by introducing creative thought as the primary uh, function of what causes value and causes the behavior of money and profit in a system by making new discoveries and leaping beyond the limits to growth. Whereas the closed system ideologues will always say, no, what exists now is what is all that ever could exist. And it's just a matter of um, managing the scarcity in a world of diminishing returns as an elite has to be, you know, in power to control the um, the system that is going through a heat death. Yeah. So um, people like JFK, again, Lincoln, McKinley, they were all part of this, Roosevelt, Hamilton. And uh, that's the that's the fight today. Um, and yeah, it, hey, it's like, enjoy your dystopia and you'll own nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll own nothing to be happy. So and, nothing and so, to be happy. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's whether left or right, it's all, it, it's fake, this whole oh. idea that, you know, uh, we have to all of these battles that have happened between in families, as you said, Republican Democrat splits. And it's like, no, it, both parties have been taken over by largely um, deconstructionist anti human. And in fact, when you scratch on the surface, it gets kind of satanic. You got to uh, wonder, right? I mean, come things on. Get, there's some evil that is going on under the under the, the surface there. And um, and they're both it's all converging on the same ultimate destination, which is why you have people like Liz Cheney, the, the Republican and, oh, and the you fanatic, you know, the oh, what, what I, Liz Cheney. Oh, I oh yeah. That. Liz. Yeah. You got the they're all working together. Right. So you got Hillary Clinton and the these these Democratic liberal imperialist warmongers working very closely. Oh, yeah, yeah, with yeah. Right wing neocon uh, uh, non liberal warmongers, all of whom get the same effect, which is what Trotsky wanted when he called for global revolution. And he said, you know, like we have, we cannot have just socialism in one country, which was what Stalin said. He's like, no, let's just figure out how to end hunger and get prosperity in one country. Let's not do this whole global, global revolution thing. thing. Yeah. Right. And Trotsky was like, no, it's everything or nothing. And, and that's why Trotsky was kicked out. And that's why uh, Stalin had to deal with these, you know, Trotsky fifth columns, this deep state directed by London. Right. Um that had funded the Bolshevik revolution in Trotsky back in the, the 1905, six, seven, 17 period. And, um, and ultimately it's burned the earth and, and mystically make something new happen after destroying 
all of the traditions and everything that exists in all the relationships just destroy society, create a bifurcation point. So it gets mystical with a pseudo scientific veneer of that bifurcation point, then creating a new set of organizations that'll somehow be better and we'll have a utopia. The reality is no, it's, it's a fucking, it's a dystopia. It, it has no bearing in how human beings are wired as made in the image of God. None at all. It doesn't take into consideration the existence of the soul, the existence of God, the existence of any principles, none of that. It's purely based on a, a hyper-materialist spirituality because it is spirituality, but it, of an evil sort because it's totally. transhumanism and eugenics as their religion that they worship. It's a religion that they are, they are personally the gods <laughs> um, and we should be worshiping them. But they also ultimately define the thing that they're trying to control as a purely um, hedonistic calculating machine. That's what human beings are. Are these irrational machines whose logic is tied to uh, finding ways to satisfy our, our uh, pleasure-seeking impulses and avoiding pain? That's our programming. Right. Um, and that's how the behaviorists try to nudge us. That's how the neuro-linguistic programming has been created is to frame narratives. They don't believe in truth, right? They believe that you could just reward people, uh, give them uh, certain pleasures by rewarding their sense of wanting virtue, you know, and, 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 and this gets us into how we were all manipulated into being really. <laughs> materialism, right? Um, much. <laughs> and, uh, and ignoring the, the fact that, no, we got this universal characteristic ultimately of being both self-aware of our mortality and being able to self-perfect our choices in life as we leave something better for the next generation and use our time um, as wisely as we can to, to express our existence as instruments of, the, of God's creation, right? Instruments of God. And, and we are all, we can all be that and we should be that regardless if we're African or, you know, Hutu, Tutsi, Indian, Hindu, <laughs> whatever, like that's where Protestant, Catholic, Catholic, whatever. it goes on and on, right? <laughs> yeah, we could totally get, we could totally have a coherent system of win-win cooperation. And I think that's why the, the Eurasian um, partnership, which yeah, is yeah. increasingly growing now, they announced a, a G8 this week, you know, Putin announced a G8 that involves like what, uh, China, India, Russia, Indonesia, yeah. uh, Mexico, um, forgetting somebody, Iran, and uh it's all these different diverse cultures that are all in it now with a common sense of both the enemy on a negative basis, but also a sense of what is their uh, foundation of mutual self-interest in working on projects that make their lives better for their kids. And that's, that's what we used to have um, before we were born <laughs> as, yeah. as a more normalized part of Western civilization, which has been really corrupted and, and forgotten. So we're at this point yeah. now, and I think that uh, to the degree that we adhere to, yeah. The idea of British free trade liberalism and like personal autonomy as like my sole point of fight against this oligarchy, we're screwed. That's that's not that's not all it is. There's there's something more to it. And uh, free trade is not a bad thing intrinsically. Like it's, it's actually a good thing. I'll just say, you know, like Alexander Hamilton fought for free trade amongst the states coming out of the American Revolution. Because before that, each state was fighting for their own little mini micro self-interest against their neighbors, and there was no unified nation. And without a unified nation, they were it was only a matter of time before the U.S. was going to be reabsorbed back in the British Empire. So he promoted free trade amongst each state, and he got it. Um, and it, cr it created a climate of prosperity, good competition. But the reason why it worked is because there was a protective tariff um, around the, the 13 colonies that then grew – defending them from flood you know british flooding of the markets with cheap cheap shit right like what um, we have and, now. <laughs> yeah that's exactly what we got now undercutting the the farmer and the the local producer of especially the manufacturer because yeah. britain just wants their their target country to stay agrarian resource extracting base but not to have high technology manufacturing that's that's a no-no um so canada for example being a british colony always never even had free trade amongst the provinces. Even to this very day, there is no free trade because Britain created a structure in Canada to be as uh, divided as possible so that it could be better controlled. Of and we see the effect of that. We got a bigger landmass than the Americans, a lot of potential, but one-tenth of the population and the only like seven cities that are like kind of relatively big, we only got like seven cities strung within 100 miles of the U.S. border. There's like... That's where 95% of the population is located. There's nothing going on beyond that. And you're like, why? It's not like we can't do it. 
it's not like we, we, yeah. we can't have cities up in, mm. you know, throughout, throughout all of Canada that are, that are very well developed. I know it's cold, but I know there's a, there's a Canadian shield, but there is that, that is provably not a reason why you can't have a civilizational growth. There's all sorts of technologies that you can build even on permafrost. If you want to go that far, you could do that, but there's been an, a concerted effort to keep Canada underpopulated, underdeveloped, better controlled, better divided, and better controlled only by the financier class that runs through the Privy Council office in, in Ottawa and other things. Whereas in America, there's a very different set of experiences, which allows you to have 10 times more people um, at, you know, with a very different historical set of traditions and norms. Um, even though it's harder to see today being 50, 60 years after, you know, Bobby Kennedy's murder, the rot has settled in. So it's a little bit difficult sometimes to identify it. Right. But we couldn't get like a Trump phenomenon in Canada. I'm sorry to say it. We just can't. Um, it's too controlled. Whereas in the U.S., you can organize yourselves to do these things. And a member of a, of a political party in the U.S. is allowed to break with their party's politics. In Canada, you can't do that. It's a party system. So you're out of your, you're out of your party if you stand for your conscience against your party's will. And you have whips to keep every person in, in place. So, you know, in the U.S., you can have somebody who's, a, who's out of the establishment and break um, their party free of this parasite. Right. Yeah. And that's the value of a republic, which right. you don't get with a monarchical parliamentary type of structure, which is much more controlled by a deep state. You can, you can do good things, but it's much harder, much harder. So I was going to ask you if there's any hope for the Canadians, <laughs> but after that, I guess it doesn't. <laughs> no, I'm just. Nah, dude. No, there, there is. There is. I just, but to be, to be real, I don't want to give people false hope. Like they got to, no, you know, no, my no. Canadians have to be aware of the operation of the terrain that they're operating in. And uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I was super enlivened to see not only the freedom convoy that was able to organize out of love and despite the efforts made to try to turn it into a, a violent, a violent uh, movement with provocateurs and people who were deployed in there by intelligence operations uh, to turn it violent. It did not. There were people, the Canadians kept the head on their shoulders, their hearts sure, yeah. were alive and it, it kept, yeah, kept peaceful. And we saw the effect of that, yeah. which was just millions of people, millions beyond anything that was expected who, who got out of their homes off of their, off of Facebook and, and put their bodies into the process you know, and yeah, you had like bouncy castles and, and super nice things like that. And people were feeding the homeless and it was super peaceful with all of the parallel movements across uh, the country. Yeah. And from what I understand now, it seems like there's a process to uh, create another uh, freedom uh, quasi convoy. I don't think there's going to be trucks in Ottawa on Canada Day, which um, from what I've read, the plan is to apparently um, stay throughout the entire summer. Um, which is an interesting experiment. And that, again, demonstrates a quality that even though in the political leadership class is devoid of leadership right. with any sense of what to do, even amongst the better uh, politicians, I don't see any semblance of an idea of what can be done faced with the objective crisis that we have coming on. We have a population which has access to strong humanity. Um, so that's there. And there are some people like Brian Peckford, who's uh, one of the, he's the last living um, author of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mm -hmm. He has exhibited some, some strong leadership capacities right now coming out uh, fighting in defense of freedom. And I've, I've been very impressed listening to him. And I think that there are people within the Conservative Party and within the People's Party of Canada who also exhibit um, a very strong morality, a strong ethic and a, a sense of freedom um, that need perhaps sometimes to be educated, just like the Republican, the better Republicans in the U.S., in terms of this deeper history, in terms of the principles of, of economic warfare. But, uh, you know, that that's something that each of us has to take responsibility for, which you guys are doing marvelously right now. <laughs> hey, hey, Matt, do you, do you find that, because uh, obviously you're getting some reception now that, you know, Mal Kay and some of these influencers from the States are, are contacting you. Are you finding it also like gaining ground in Canada since all this has happened for, you know, for the Canadian Patriot Review and, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, there's there's a huge uh, receptivity right now. Like the Canadian Patriot website is just, I mean, it, it's blowing up in terms of activity. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, like it's, it's, it's exponentially uh, bigger today than it was even just like five, six months ago. Wow. Um, I think the Freedom Convoy was a big moralizing impetus. Um, yeah. definitely the, the Patriot movement in the U S is resonating very nicely. 
Um, we're getting a lot of good contacts uh, across, you know, you mentioned Mel Kay. She's yeah. highly hooked up. We got Periscope Media. Uh, people like Sean Morgan have been super receptive and, and many others. Yeah, sure. um, you got things like TNT Radio as well, Australian based with a big, a uh, lot of outlets in America. Um, but anyway, yeah, there, there's, there's definitely a hunger to, uh, to look for hard, like workable solutions. I think that um, while Trump is, is, is confused, he is, I think, a still one of the few viable, personally, I mean, people, people hate him. You know, a lot of people hate him. A lot of people love him. I think right. that there's a lot of humanity inside of him still, despite his missteps. And I think that he has exhibited uh, a capacity to fight um, over the past four or five years, which I have not seen in, in many other uh, individuals. And you do need a, a so-called champion, you know, like I, people get right. turned off by the word leader, but I mean, you do need in battle in the real world, a McKinley, you need somebody who is going to take responsibility voluntarily and right. risk their necks. And with a good insight into the, the topography of evil, um, with a sense of traditions. And he did, um, exhibit, like he did work very hard to return the Republican party to its Lincoln roots. And he's given many speeches calling for, in, despite the fact that Lincoln is hated by, I would say that most Republicans of a higher level. How so, is that um, even possible? I don't know. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's this small as small as good thing. It's, it's this, uh, not small as good. It's this, um, uh, British free trade ideology that took the form of the Austrian school libertarianism of Friedrich von Hayek and von Mises and Karl, Karl Menger, um, which through the, the von Mises Institute and uh, not, von, not von Mises Institute, sorry, I'm getting it wrong here, through the uh, Mont Pelerin Society um, after World War II really latched on and infused its um, Austrian school ideology into the governing class of the Republicans which increasingly became the, 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 the idea of that was that all use of government is evil and bad government can do not, but destroy and lead to tyranny. Thus, um, deregulation, destroying the role of the government in playing a role, kind of like what the Confederacy was doing. That's, that's the Confederacy outlook. Um, because every time you have a law, the law infringes upon individual freedom to do whatever you want to do. Now, personally, that's not actually a competent definition of freedom. That's just license. Yeah. Um, but so they, they got the idea, a priori, that that um, personal liberty to do whatever you want, to do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. Sound familiar, right? Okay. <laughs> Alistair Crowley. Uh, that's the first principle of what is good, the right of every individual to do whatever they want to do. And anytime you have a dimin diminution of that is thus bad. And thus, any time you have law, it is thus a diminution of your freedom and thus bad. And thus, the thing that causes laws is the maximum bad, which is government. So, and this is what Jefferson was contaminated by, which is also why Jefferson saw no problem in or no first, um, discrepancy between him being the, one of the biggest slave owners of Virginia um, and writing a text that said all men are created equal. He wasn't able to identify why that didn't work. Um, so there's this inability to res to see paradox or let alone resolve a paradox because you can't resolve what you can't see and they can't see that all of the infrastructure that has given them the privilege and the abundance that to have a, to be called a first world society was never built with their ideology their ideology is always just something the free the adam smith libertarian free market ideology is something you can sort of like uh impose onto the management of infrastructure after it is built and then, you know, extract money out of it, you know, pay per use or something, PPPs, uh, like pri public private partnerships as well. It, you, so you could extract money um, with a sort of free market ideology from things, but you can't build things that way. None of right. them, all of these things were built with protectionism, state backed credit, government, right. Right. Um So, the, you know, this is what is behind, I think, a lot of the confusion of the Republican Party. And as such, they hate Lincoln or even McKinley. They Less McKinley because there was less propaganda over the years to put forth narratives that paint McKinley as such a bad guy. There are they're, they're there, but there's not as much uh, there is not as much as was put on Lincoln. Um, they definitely were calling both of them imperialists, though. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
You know what I mean? It's just amazing the way they keep flipping that word around as we're living yeah. in there. You know, just as a quick note here. What the fuck? Yo, man, I, just, as a quick, quick note, because one of the things often that touches on what we were saying earlier about Africa and the, the natives, uh, the First Nations, um, people say, oh, yeah, Lincoln was was a ra racist because he supported um, uh, sending black people back to Africa uh, into Liberia, into Liberia um, specifically in, in, a, in Sierra Leone. And it's like, yeah, he kind of did support that if they wanted to. It was voluntary, by the way. And number two, he also supported helping industrialize and develop Africa so that they weren't going to just be sent back into a new plantation situation. Right. Wow, that's that a... was never permitted because he died. So you're going to blame him for things that happened because yeah. he died that he had nothing <laughs> to do with? That's what happens. You know, same yeah. thing for the... The, the First Nations people and, and, and the, you know, the Confederate South, like yeah. it, you, the idea was to have full blown Hamiltonian industrialization, manufacturing, like a high tech advanced open system society that was going to be open for all people to, to participate in, which is, again, very similar when you look at get beyond the, the slanders against China. But look at what China has been doing in right. regard to its relationship to both Africa, where it's helping Africans develop engineering cadres that are able to, in a short period of time, build and maintain and then improve upon those things that China is helping to build for the very first time in Africa with in industries that the West never permitted, or in Xinjiang or in Tibet. This is not imperialism. If you actually look past, again, the slander and look at what has been done on the ground in Xinjiang and Tibet um, over the past decade, especially, let's go 20 years even, Sure. It's miraculous. The increase of life expectancy has doubled, tripled in some cases. The overall population of Xinjiang, which we're told is suffering genocide. Uh, that's why we're sanctioning China's for uh, genocide against the Muslim Uyghurs. Um, th their population is 2.5 times higher than it was 40 years ago. That's the most opposite to genocide. When you're popular, they never had a one child policy. It's only that was only for the Han Chinese. And that was a mistake. But it was never, you could always have five, six, seven kids as a Muslim in China or as a Tibetan. That was never, you know, and the, the, not only the life expectancy has increased and the overall population, but the, the per capita productive powers, as well as a no loss to their indigenous cultures, traditions, dances, and language. Right. They're just learning Mandarin as well. But they're also learning engineering and they're learning their ancient stories and their ancient, their, their, Per, their 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 language uh, dialects and everything that that's still being maintained. They got more community centers and more mosques in uh, in Xinjiang than they ever have in history. So you know, like, and they have high speed rail. We have no high speed rail. They got they got multiple lines and you know faster internet <laughs> than I do. Here, so, here, <laughs> it's like here comes the, it, it is the revival of the Silk Road, man. It's for real. Yeah, and that was what Lincoln was. That was his philosophy. That was McKinley's philosophy. That was that was FDR's philosophy when he was, you know, negotiating. Um, they, they all use that. They all use that term, revival of the Silk Road, kind of philosophy in their minds or, or in their talks. Uh, the only person who did that was William Gilpin, the first governor of Colorado. Oh, Gilpin. Um, who did? Yeah. Um, other than that, no, they they used different terminology, but it's the same spirit of win-win cooperation. Ultimately, right. an idea of a community of principle, as John Quincy Adams called it, was that the world has to be liberated from empire, and we need to establish a community of principle, of mutual self-interest, and that would be done through cooperation around big projects that would alleviate the universal constants of hunger, fear of war. Um, you know, basic there's basic constants of the human condition that have to be, um, that are negative constants, right? We will right. always be in danger of not having enough water or quality of water or food abundance, right? That's always a danger or yeah. peace. We might not, we'll always have danger of losing peace and having war. Yeah. Um, so to be able to diminish those over in a time function is the basis upon which trust is built, foreign policy is built, economic exchanges are built, you know, that's the, and that's the Silk Road principle. Um, as it was 2000 years ago and as it's being revived again today. Yeah. And with the sharing of the creativity, the knowledge, the arts. Right. I mean, that's what I found so interesting in that period. Mm -hmm. We, you know, the original or those early Silk Roads, like they weren't just trading goods. They were sharing knowledge and they knew languages. And right now, actually, 
what we're doing and the bridges we're making to different places in the world through zooming and and and, and the sharing of knowledge i don't really think they can stop what's already like it's almost like the ball is kicked down the mountain <laughs> and the, she's rolling <laughs> Well, I think it's definitely something new that we've never seen before. I think it's got a, a greater power to it because we've never had such a coalition of diverse cultures, ancient civilizational forces on the same page at the same time, um, the way we have today. The closest analogy I, I tend to have is the uh, late 19th century, which was still, China was completely obliterated still by the opium mm -hmm. wars. And uh, it was yeah, in the midst was. of the century of humiliation. So it couldn't really stand on its own two feet. You know, it was still many years before uh, Sun Yat-sen had affected his American modeled, um, Lincoln modeled uh, revolution, overthrowing the, the hereditary dynasty of, of, uh, of the Qing dynasty and inst instituted a republic. But that was only in 1911. So, right. you know, the, China was not a, a powerhouse. India was still very subdued by British uh, genocidal operations for nearly two centuries. Uh, Africa was being carved up in a, a whole race for resources and race for empire. That was, right. you know, 1890s. So we didn't have the type, I mean, the, the Muslim world was still largely under the, the sway of the, the Ottoman Empire, which it was trying to modernize under Otto von Bismarck's assistance with the Berlin to Baghdad railway, but it was too late in the game. The, it had gotten too decadent for mm. too many generations and it, it was not moving fast enough. So it was decapitated pretty quickly. Um, especially with the Balkan Wars of the, the 1912 period. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was too, too far behind the curve. Um, so we really just had the USA and, and some US allies in Russia and across Europe, a couple in South America, like uh, Drago, the foreign minister of, uh, or the finance minister of uh, Argentina mm. in the 1880s, 90s. Mm. Um, but it wasn't like we have anything, nothing similar to what we have today with the, you know, of, I mean, Russia, India, uh, Iran, China, like think about the diverse cultural movements. And then now Africa is jumping on board with their ancient civilizational process, which has been so subverted by British imperial and Belgian and French imperial processes that have uh, kept Africa, the Africans from any connection to their deep multi-thousand year amazing history now this there's a hunger to revive this and we see a pan-african uh revival movement happening right now largely because of the strength that is being provided by china mm. um especially ethiopia is a key part in this you know for a variety of reasons economic technological its own history its own the fact that it's the only part of africa that's never been colonized they always successfully fought back and i think that's why they're also the the leading uh bri participant right now as part of the anti-imperial fight across the continents of Africa. So there, that's, that's also why Biden is being used to deploy and destabilize Ethiopia on a variety of points, as well as Somalia. And it's, it's you know, the conjunction, the, the regions around it, um, Sudan, South Sudan. Mm. So, um, yeah, but it's a, I, I agree with you, though. I think that the, the ball is moving fast in, for the, on the side of the good. Good. Could obviously, there's no guarantees in any of this process because it's all right. contingent upon decisions made by humans with free will. But still, I think the oligarchy is not in, as in control as they would like us to believe they are. I, I and uh, it's important to keep that top down mind, uh, your mind top down thinking about the whole. Because if you get stuck just thinking about your local situation, I, it gets heavy and uh, easy to get Real. demoralized. <laughs> it's, it's not we're not in a bet in a great position here in the transatlantic. I gotta admit. <laughs> yeah man yeah. <laughs> doing what we can though right? yeah we are we can no exactly and i mean i think that a big part of this is the individual right taking responsibility for things that they never thought that they would have to take responsibility for and capacity building like we all have to you know i i know that i'm not in a position that i need to be in um in order to have any type of political um like if i'm gonna wield political power i gotta be like, I got to be better than I am. Um, so the question becomes, you know, if I'm not now at a position of leading responsibility where, like, if I'm not there today where I, I'm responsible enough to, to, to do certain things that need to happen, I got to use my time in such a way that I can capacity build, develop tools so that in, let's say, you know, next year, I'll, well, 
next month I'll be better than where than than I am today. By next year I'll I'll be even better. And maybe when the time comes, I'll have put my I'll have used my time so wisely that I can actually do what Lincoln did as a young lawyer um, who found himself in positions you know where he had to like sink or swim. You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're all in a, in that sort of uh, challenge right now. And and like Abigail Adams said, you know, we should be so lucky to be to live in a time of crisis because it does produce great men. Great crises produce great men and women. Um, so here we are. Yeah, you could just see Lincoln just laughing to himself how many times he probably was musing over something just all by himself and maybe not laughing out loud, but you can imagine in his mind if he had that kind of sense of humor, right? <laughs> yeah. Like just the ridiculousness of it all. And <laughs> even though it could be really horrific, like Britain and France and everybody closing in on him and then he thinks of something and just laughs and chuckles and then gets real serious again and gets real focused. <laughs> you know, you could imagine a man who was really, really tested and up against it. And yeah, we're going to champion Lincoln. Yeah. In this yeah. <laughs> wonderful talk. We're, we're going to disappear into the darkness soon because we're losing light. <laughs> yeah, you are. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I well, guys, this well, was like... this was super nice. This is a really nice conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This is awesome. We talked about it a little bit. We're like, yeah, we're gonna have to, um, gonna have to make set it, the tone. Set the tone. <laughs> yep. So we'll do it again for sure, brother. And hey, man, have you know? Good luck in all your moving and what have you. It sounds like you're in the midst of it. You should be done in what a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, by like the twenty fourth, we should be in a new place, and uh, hopefully, it'll be a home within a week or oh, two after like that. Oh, yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah, we gotta. We'll get your email. Um, I mean, your new address that we can send you. Um, send you some things, books. Some books. Oh yeah, the the po yeah the books. Right, congratulations on on uh, getting that published. Now that's wonderful. Yeah, that was an accomplishment. <laughs> Old Souls Guide. Yeah. Cool. I'm looking yeah, forward we'll to reading. Definitely send you some books. Got to send you a few more things. Send you a poster. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we're we definitely have a lot we're of like, walls. Like sending so. gifts. <laughs> huh? Yeah. We like sending gifts. <laughs> sure. We like receiving gifts. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Guys, yeah, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And the next time you want to talk about something, maybe we could tackle a, a little bit more of a thorough plunge into perhaps uh, FDR and his yeah, fight. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. go from Teddy to FDR. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty lawful leap, right? Um, yeah. That's sort of actually, yeah, it's, it's a good progression. And uh, yeah, it's like 30 years after after Teddy dies. Us, uh, Teddy, right. sorry. <laughs> after McKinley dies. Right. 30 years of decay, degeneration of the USA, a takeover right. again. Just like when Lincoln entered, it was almost 30 years of this process of decay. Yeah. And it's almost like you need a, a period of um, self-induced folly and self-destruction in order to create a climate where you like hunger for oxygen. You know, you got to be underwater <laughs> a little bit to really value the thing you took for granted, the breathing. Um <laughs> And that's what, what FDR stepped into. So we can, yeah, de explore uh, the multifaceted battle, which I think the only person who's been more slandered than Lincoln is Hamilton. And the only person who's been more slandered than Hamilton is FDR um, for Americans. Yeah, right. That's crazy. I, I like this. I'm learning so much. I like this, I like this, <laughs> this approach that we're doing. <laughs> cool. All right, me too. Hey, right. give our best to Cynthia too. Yes, please. God bless you. I'm going to send her an email, so I'm going to be in touch with her myself. <laughs> All right, awesome. God bless you guys. Yeah, okay, have a great care. weekend. Peace. Bye. Bye. Peace.